Greetings, Presbyterian Church of Dover, members, friends, those who are worshiping with us uh, virtually online. Glad you're with us today and uh, um, hope this will be a meaningful worship experience for you. A little bit later, I'm going to be talking about being disciples of Jesus Christ. And uh, part of our being disciples is the supporting of the work of the church through our financial gifts. And when we worship virtually like this, it's, it's easy to forget our giving. And so I want to encourage you to, uh, to continue to support the church financially. And perhaps that's sending your, your, uh, your gifts in through the mail or setting up a, a way that your bank account sends money to the church. Uh, but we need to continue to support the church with our gifts so that we can continue uh, being a presence in, in this community and uh, present in the world today. As I'd like to start each of our worship services with this, whoever you are and wherever you are on your faith's journey, you are welcome here. And we pray that the transforming love of Jesus might touch your life today. So let us enter into our worship. As we gather for worship, hear the call. From God comes my salvation. For God alone my soul waits in silence. God alone is my rock and my salvation. God is my fortress. I shall not be shaken. Let us pray together. You are our rock and our strength, O God, and in you rests our deliverance. You defend us in the midst of adversity. You protect us from ultimate harm. You humble the mighty with acts that manifest your transcendent power. The lowly you comfort with your tender embrace. We gather this day saved by your mercy. Hear now our praises as we herald your greatness. Amen. And now hear the prayer of illumination as we hear God's word. Speak to us your word, O God, that we may hear Jesus' call to be his disciples. Amen. This morning's first reading comes from chapter 3 of the book of Jonah, the first five verses. Hear now the word of God. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Get up. Go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days walk across. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's walk, and he cried out, Forty days more, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast, and everyone, great and small, put on sackcloth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our gospel lesson this morning comes from the Gospel of Mark, the first chapter verses 14 through 28. Listen to the word of God. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat mending the nets. Immediately he called them and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men 
and followed him. The word of God, thanks be to God. I want to talk primarily about our Old Testament reading, or about Jonah. It's a short little book, only four chapters, and the chapters aren't very long. And we read only a portion of chapter 3. So let me fill you in on what happened in chapters 1 and 2. Sit right back and you'll hear a tale. A tale of a faithful trip that started from a Joppa port aboard a merchant ship. The prophet was a running away, trying to escape God. He boarded that merchant ship, trying to get away, trying to get away. The weather started getting rough. The merchant ship was tossed. Everyone feared for their lives. They prayed to their gods, asking that the ship not be lost, that the ship not be lost. The prophet fell asleep below, not caring of the storm. The sailors woke him and chastised him too. The crew cast lots, Jonah lost. They threw him overboard and sailed away, leaving Jonah for the whale, leaving Jonah for the whale. So Jonah finds himself in the water and has to be thinking, what else could possibly go wrong? Well, there is that. I can hear Jonah as he flounders in the belly of the fish. Holy mackerel! What's the purpose of all this? And of course, the answer is that God is calling Jonah to go to Nineveh and to preach. So Jonah repents and the fish spits him up and he does go to Nineveh and he begins to preach. And he preaches this fire and brimstone message that telling them that in 40 days, the jig is up and punishment is a coming. And we read how the people listened and they repented and turn to God. We didn't read chapter four, where I imagine Jonah was sitting outside of the city and he, he had opened his, his Old Testament, reading the book of Genesis, especially that chapter that talks about the, destruct, the destruction that comes to the city of Sodom. And he's just waiting, saying, this is gonna to happen to Nineveh. And he can't wait. But what? And, and he's thinking, it's going to be a great show when the fire comes down and the brimstone and everything's destroyed. Maybe, maybe this will, 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 will move him from being a minor prophet to being one of the major prophets. But what happened next was just totally incomprehensible to Jonah. A great revival breaks out and God forgives the people. God's grace rules the day. And Jonah is beside himself with anger. Chapter 4 tells us that uh, while Jonah was waiting for the punishment to come, God allows... A, a vine to grow up around Jonah that gives him shelter from the sun. But the next day a worm comes and kills the vine. And it's just getting worse and worse for Jonah. First God doesn't destroy the city and now the vine is dead and Jonah is so angry he could die. And God rebukes him. Jonah cared more for the, the plant than he did for all the people of Nineveh and for the cattle. We, we, we might not understand the cattle part, but that's the economy. It's not just the people, it's the whole of society that God cared for. Jonah hated the people, but God loved them. 
So let me step back a second, give you a little historical perspective of what's going on. Nineveh was the capital of Assyria. Nineveh is located in modern day Iraq. And it was, a, a, Assyria was a major empire uh, of the seventh and sixth centuries BC. And they were an evil and violent empire. And when they conquered a town, they would gather the leaders together and they would take out their eyes and then force them to listen as they tortured the women and children in front of them. They would leave all the dead bodies in the road as they would move on to the next town or village. They would also send people in to the, into the uh, areas that they've conquered, people the Assyrians into the place to, to in some ways repopulate the area. They'd come in and they'd marry those people who were left behind and start new families. And this is what happened in Israel. In 721 uh, BC, Assyria conquered Israel. And, and um, the people they sent in to remarry and to repopulate became the Samaritans that we know in the New Testament. Those half-breeds that the Jews hated. So you get an idea why Jonah hated the Assyrians. And although he didn't want to go there at first, he eventually did, does go. And he, he took great pleasure in preaching that turn or burn message. He just didn't like it when the people did turn and turn to God and God forgave them. You know, outside the book of Jonah, we have no record of this revival in Assyria. But we do have in the, in the Bible, another prophet, Nahum, who comes about a hundred years later and he too preaches judgment coming to Nineveh. And this time it does come. In 612 BC, the Babylonians came and they conquered and destroyed the Assyrians. The question is, why didn't the spiritual revival take in Nineveh that a hundred years later, uh, they were just being destroyed because of the evil. I believe it's because Jonah preached a half God, ha pe preached half the gospel, a scare tactic, if you please. It was revival without discipleship. And that's a dangerous thing. We see the difference in our gospel reading where Jesus was going around preaching and he was preaching repentance, inviting people to become part of the kingdom of God. But we also read how he was gathering to himself disciples, people that he could pour his life into and train and prepare them so that, that they would spread this message and keep it alive. And 2,000 years later, we are the result of that. And yet I worry today about the church in our country. You know, before COVID, there were between 40 and 50 uh, Christians in church in our country every Sunday. Who knows what that number is now because of COVID. I'm sure it's much less. And yet, with so many people claiming to be followers of Jesus, what impact has our church been having on our society? According to the late historian or late Harvard professor, William McLaughlin, religious awakenings usually have profound social consequences. It's not just the people who are changed, but society has changed. You know, the early church started in a remote area of the world with about 120 people. But it became the official religion of the, the Roman Empire, which spread across all of, of Europe and, into, and parts of Asia. And, and it did so in just a little over 300 years. 
disciples spreading the message and changing the world. I also think of the Wesleyan revival in the 1700s in England. This, re this religious re uh, revival had an enormous impact on society. Not only did many people come to know God in a personal way during this time, but it also had major social impacts. People changed the way they behave, and uh, laws were created that ended child labor and ended slavery throughout the, the British Empire. Many credit this uh, revival as preventing in England what happened in France with the French Revolution. Yet if you go to Europe today, the place where God accomplished so much, it's now spiritually dead. The church is pretty much irrelevant in that society. It has little to no influence in many of the European countries today. And I wonder if the same thing is happening in our country. Our, our churches, as you know, are in decline. More and more people claim to be nuns when it comes to religious affiliation. They claim to be spiritual, but not religious. As we think how we live out our Christian faith and how we do ministry, we need to keep in mind that, um, that, that we, we are to do, be presenting the whole gospel to the whole city. And this means that we deal not only with people's spiritual issues, but we deal with the societal and, and physical issues that people have. I certainly believe that as we seek to be a Matthew 25 church, we are moving in the right direction in, in, do, in doing these things. But to be a Matthew 25 church, we must commit ourselves to being disciples of Jesus Christ, to follow his teachings and to make the values of his kingdom our values. Jonah didn't love the Ninevites and he couldn't comprehend that God was bigger than his culture. He couldn't understand God's grace, that God was willing to forgive the most violent people in the Middle East. But God is a God of mission not retaliation, a God of love and not hatred. God is at work in the whole person. So let us be about the things of God. Let us not run away from our calling, but enter into our calling with excitement and joy and passion, anticipating all that God wants to accomplish through us. Let us commit ourselves to being disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ and keeping his message of love and grace alive. And may we, uh, could, and, and may this gospel continue to challenge us to change our lives and the lives of others and to, to even impact our society and our world. Amen. So let us move to the prayers of the people. Our breath prayer this morning is, we want to inhale, Christ is calling me to follow, and exhale, I will follow. Christ is calling me to follow, I will follow. So let us take a minute and center ourselves with these breath prayers. Gracious God, you have called us to be disciples of Jesus Christ, to be fishers of people, to spread the good news of the kingdom of God. May we be faithful in doing this. May our faith have an impact not only in how we live, 
but also an impact in our community and in the world. Bring about a spiritual revival in our country, one that leads to transforming lives, but also reforms our society. Helps us, help us to be a Matthew 25 church, seeking to revitalize our church, to eradicate systemic poverty, and to dismantle structural racism. Guide us in how we might do that. We thank you, O oh God, for our church and our country. We do thank you as we think of our country. Uh, we thank you for the peaceful transition of power this past week. And we do pray for healing of the partisan divides that we have and ask that our government leaders might work together for the good of the country. We continue our prayers concerning the pandemic and ask that you bring healing to those who are sick, that the spread of the virus might slow down and that people might quickly be vaccinated. We ask that you comfort those who have lost loved ones Strengthen those who are on the front lines of caring for those who are sick. We also lift up to you our prayer list and ask that you hear our prayers for those on that list. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus, and we offer up the prayer that he's taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Repent and believe the good news that God is with us and God calls us for a purpose. And now, May the God of second chances renew your sense of call and inspire you to go out and share the good news of forgiveness and hope. Go in peace. Amen. <laughs>